Well, thank you everyone for coming to um, the Data Governance Conference and to our specific breakout session uh, called Data Privacy and Data Governance, Unlocking the Possible. Um, today, we're really gonna focus on lessons learned from an early childhood uh, data trust being built out in Kansas right now uh, with the Kansas Children's Cabinet and Trust Fund and with the Kansas University Center for Public Partnerships and Research. Um, and we have Terry with us and Melissa, who I'll let introduce themselves. Um, who are representatives from those organizations who can, can really help us kind of dive deeply into some of the early lessons emerging from that work. Um, so as a way of introduction, my name is Brian Lim. I am a policy fellow at BrightHive. I am also a master's of public policy candidate at Duke, where I focus on issues around uh, privacy, cybersecurity policy, uh, and data governance and data sharing. Uh, and Melissa, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure, thank you, Brian. It's nice to be here today. My name is Melissa Rooker. I am currently serving as the Executive Director of the Kansas Children's Cabinet and Trust Fund. And prior to that, I spent three terms as a member of the Kansas House of Representatives. So I've been focused on children's issues in a couple different ways for um, a good long time. And I look forward to the conversation today. All right, thanks, Melissa and Terry. Hi there, this is Terry Garska, and um, I'm with the University of Kansas Center for Public Partnerships and Research. And we have supported our state agencies, particularly in early childhood, for the last decade or so. Um, I'm particularly interested in data science and bringing that to social services. Um, and I, with Melissa, have been working on how to integrate our early childhood data uh, in Kansas to better serve kids and families in our state. And Obviously, we are interested in building a solid foundation of data governance first. So that's what you'll hear about today. All right. So the structure for this um, breakout is going to really focus around two parts. So the first will just be a presentation talking about some of the general lessons learned from my conversations with Terry and Melissa. And then we'll shift to a Q&A uh, with Terry and Melissa where you all can ask them questions about some of the specific lessons or we can dive more deeply on some of the details in the presentation. Okay, so before diving into kind of the lessons learned and what's going on in Kansas, I wanna talk about some context uh, for early childhood data in Kansas right now. So right now, Kansas has a wealth of early childhood data, uh, but it is split and kind of siloed across several different state agencies, right? So there's the Department of Health and Environment, the Department of Education, the Department for Children and Families, and the Children's Cabinet. And each of these state agencies maintain their own separate sorts of data sets around these data, um, in some cases, there might be some duplication. In other cases, they're completely separate sets of data, but they're slightly related. And they're not always talking to each other in, in a convenient and kind of easily accessible way, right? It's very siloed at the moment. So why is that a problem? So these data sets controlled by different agencies aren't easily connected. And when that happens, that means we can't really leverage uh, some of these sort of broader findings from having a broader set of data. It's harder to look at outcomes uh, across sort of a long, longer period of time from kind of preschool education through K through 12 education, right? So think of this as kind of four people speaking different languages who all want to work together, right? Uh, if they only speak the languages that they speak, they're gonna have trouble kind of actually accomplishing any work, right? And even if they do speak similar languages, uh, they might have different kind of cultural practices around working that, that might not line up perfectly, right? So one of the things we need to do is find a solution to that. So we need to bring the data sets into a single system while still respecting the differences in legal practices that need to be covered, privacy practices that need to be covered, and data ownership, right? These state agencies are not necessarily gonna want to completely surrender their control of the data. They need to kind of reflect that they have ownership of this data, but also participate in a space where we can focus on collaboration. Right? So in the context of this country example, think of something like the EU, right? A place for people to collaborate to kind of lower these barriers to cross country communication and collaboration, but not something that's going to completely erase the specific identities and legal practices within these different countries. And a data trust kind of fills that gap, right? So a data trust is a common governance framework that's designed to facilitate these types of connections across these different state agencies uh, while still respecting those differences, right? So the Department of Health and the Environment is obviously going to be very concerned with HIPAA, right? The Department of Education is probably gonna be more concerned with FERPA. And keeping these differences in mind and also keeping the different practices that the agencies might have and the different kind of ownership levels that they might have over these data uh, can allow us to create a framework that 
fosters collaboration without kind of pushing these agencies out or kind of fostering any sort of division, right? And this is where the Children's Cabinet and CPPR really come in. Uh, both of these agencies have experience working with some of this data, have a stake in this, in, in this data collaborative uh, environment, and can really kind of lead the charge on, on pushing some of that work to the forefront. So this is where we get into some of our first lessons learned, right? And this first is around fostering collaboration. <clears throat> So data trust isn't built in a day. Um, you know, we can throw together a framework very, very easily, uh, but it's not gonna be a framework that everyone agrees to, right? It's just gonna be words on paper until we get all of the different stakeholders to sign on and agree to participate in this, right? And that's gonna take a lot of different work. Uh, and it comes down to kind of these three different components, right? So to get people to, to sign on and actually start this collaboration, we need the politics to be behind us. And what I mean here is not you know, we need Republicans or Democrats to buy in one or the other. I, I mean kind of the broader political environment of support for this kind of work, uh, funding for this kind of work, just an overall political atmosphere that enables data collaboration. The next thing you need is a champion for this kind of work. It's, it's very easy to say that once we have the politics in place, this will all just kind of take care of itself, but that's not actually what happens. You can have all of the kind of broad political support and will to do this, but unless you have a specific individual who can kind of take charge, lead the way, and start bringing some of these diverse stakeholders to the table, uh, you're, not, you're, you're never going to accomplish actually putting together a data trust. The third piece is data expertise. And this gets to something that Nancy Smith was saying in the keynote panel as well. We need to bring researchers into this, people who have experience working with this data and leveraging this data to actually achieve outcomes or, or measure impacts on outcomes. Uh, and if we have that expertise built in from the very start, we can ensure that this governance framework is designed in a way that will actually impact outcomes. So this first is kind of around politics, right? So in Kansas, conversations about an integrated data collaborative started in around 2011 to 2013. Uh, but there was never kind of a consolidated political effort behind getting this to, to come to the forefront. And in 2014, Kansas passed the Kansas Student Data to Privacy Act which kind of lowered willingness to discuss a data sharing program across these different state agencies. And I wanna be clear here that there's nothing in the Student Data Privacy Act that would completely stop these types of data collaborative efforts. It's more that in 2014, these state agencies were going to be much more concerned with meeting the compliance requirements for the new law. Melissa, Brian, you to... I, I would just interject, that was a really crushing political battle over data privacy in general. So while the law that passed was specific to student data in our K through 12 public system, it was really a difficult time in the world of, of data governance and, and data use. And there, you know, all of the national narratives around Common Core and, and, and all of the invasions of privacy were front and center. I sat through a nine hour committee hearing. It was broken out, um, you know, started at seven in the morning for a couple hours and we adjourned to have other committees and house session and, and worked over the lunch hour and then we worked till nine that night. It was public testimony and like I used, I made a tin foil hat out of the, the tin foil that wrapped my, um, the, the meal they carried in because that was the level of conspiracy mongering that was going on in our committee hearing about all the nefarious ways that data would be utilized by the state and it really got in the way of all the, the, the good and necessary uses of data and we are just emerging from that. And I think to add on to that, um, you know, something that Nancy Smith said in our plenary around kind of a unique ID and tracking the, the idea of tracking kids from, you know, birth on up through um, career and uh, college was, um, you know, that doesn't fly in many parts of our state. And even today, um, that that framing is, is not what's going to win the day. You know, we've, we've really tried to change the narrative around how we're talking about that. That's why governance and privacy and confidentiality is so important, because we need to talk about um, effectiveness and impact. And to do that, you need to integrate some data to be able to show outcomes. And so that flipping of the, of the script and the narrative is what um, I think helped us in the long run to overcome some of the, some of the 
uh, framing of, of data tracking of, of kids and families. I, I think those are all really important points. Um, and, and you can imagine, I think, from the environment that Melissa described, why state agencies, even if they might individually or if their leadership recognizes that there is a benefit to this type of data collaborative program, would be very hesitant in a political atmosphere that is very anti-data sharing and is very kind of strongly behind privacy protections, but in a way that they might be trying to protect against harms that don't really exist. Um, but that started to change, as, as Terry mentioned, with their framing efforts going on. And then in 2020, Kansas was awarded a grant from the Administration for Children and Families. And that grant was focused on improving uh, Kansas's services offerings for uh, childhood services. And part of that was improving kind of this, this data infrastructure. And that kind of started to consolidate political support more around this idea of a data collaborative, right? When there's money available and people are starting to realize that there are benefits for this, these state agencies are much more likely to come on board. They're much more willing to collaborate. But again, as I said earlier, having this political will there doesn't mean this gets done on its own, right? You really need someone to take leadership and ownership over this and kind of lead the charge. And, and Brian, I would, I would also add that, um, you know, when we look at the sort of the national landscape of where states are at with their early childhood data and integrating it with K through 12 and beyond, you know, Kansas is not leading in, um, in this work. Um, there were several states who got um, raised to the top dollars. This was one of their big uh, efforts. So there has been money um, for other states to, to move ahead with early childhood data. Um, we just didn't happen to get that in the past. And so with our, our preschool development grant and some of the requirements that came out of, um, of, of that funding, there was um, a major emphasis on getting your data house in order in early childhood. And so that we sort of reignited uh, the work that we had been talking about early. But, but just know that um, there are some other states who certainly have addressed these issues um, in different ways. And so as, as folks hear about Kansas, know that there are other models for how we bring early childhood uh, data together. And what we're presenting is, is really around a Kansas, um, a Kansas approach, which means building upon good data governance and privacy before we invest in expensive technical uh, solutions. So um, that's just some, some broader context for folks. Well, and before you move on, I, I just would add that the way we're making headway today is by answering lawmaker challenges for how, how is the system accountable for all of this money being appropriated and, and how do we know it's worth it and, and, you know, they hammer away at funding for public schools and student you know, they, they look at the one data point of state assessment scores, uh, um, really changing, shifting the narrative to show them that to answer their own questions, we're going to need to manage our data differently has been a, a winning strategy. And I think that segues nicely into, into my next point about having really a champion for these policies. Um, so as I was saying before, you can have all the political support in the world, but if you don't have someone to kind of lead this charge, you're not going to get anywhere. And that's where someone like Melissa comes in and really fills that gap nicely. Uh, Melissa has broad experience in PTA from state level PTA advocacy down to local PTA organizations, as well as experience on school district advisory boards. Uh, and that kind of broad education experience really kind of set her up for success in understanding where uh, the benefits for this data lie and, and what kind of benefits a data collaborative could add um, and her experience as a state legislator also kind of set her up for, as she was saying, being able to communicate with these stakeholders, right, and kind of frame things in the right way to help bring them on board. Uh, Melissa, I don't know if you want to add anything else there. Yeah, it's just understanding the language that the lawmakers are speaking and, and using it to turn it around and, and tell our story and explain you know, not that we are trying to suck up all kinds of new data, but utilizing the data that's already collected and leveraging it in a way that will have a, a, a more impactful story to tell, that, that we can better show the connection between investments. Um, there's a big focus on our foster care system and uh, you know we're trying to to get all of this connected up so that we can show 
um, what happens when kids receive a, a, a whole universe of, of services to help support not just the child, but their family and, and you know, all of the efforts that go on in child welfare actually have a c connection to um, how they do in school from attendance to test scores. And then ultimately telling the longitudinal picture long term, what, what effect does this have beyond high school? It aligns with our state education standards and, and the, the State Board of Education vision. Um, so I, it's just a nice time in, in the state of things here in Kansas to, to be connecting the dots for, for people. And I think uh, when, when you think about coalition building around other state agencies and, and some of the conversations in the plenary around reciprocity, um, surrounding Melissa is, are also some early childhood leaders in each of those state agencies in our Department for Children and Families, um, Department of Health and Environment, and um, our State Department of Education. Those early childhood leaders, uh, there's no convincing them around the benefits of, of integrated data across early childhood. They're, they're all on board. They, they've, they've seen the value. Um, they have their own questions. They're highly supportive. So that kind of collaboration. Um, we don't need to convince um, uh, the willing. Uh, uh, you know, Melissa leading the charge, but she also has a, a number of uh, state agency partners who are very willing to advance this. And I think that's um, some, sometimes stars align, and I think that the stars have aligned. And so that's um, an important con context. And I think that's a really good point, Terry, that this kind of idea of a champion doesn't just necessarily have to lie in one person, right? As you were saying, there can be sort of maybe smaller champions and smaller stakeholders or just a, across different roles across agencies. And I think the key to kind of advancing this work is starting to identify those stakeholders and really kind of bringing them on board to help drive this work forward across the various different groups that you're working with. And that leads into the last of these three things that you really need to build up a successful data trust, um, which is data expertise. And I think this goes to the point that Nancy Smith was making earlier about, about bringing researchers into the fold at early stages to talk about how this data can actually be leveraged, right? It's one thing to say, we'll bring it all into one space and make sure it talks to each other. It's another to say, we'll actually use this in a way that can measure impact of policies, that can inform better policy making and better decision making activities, right? And that's where uh, KUCPPR comes in. Uh, they have a, a sort of broad depth of experience working across areas that are collecting this type of data, that are leveraging this type of data to answer some of these really crucial research questions, and that have expertise in how to handle and treat some of the different types of data we're working with, whether that's FERPA or HIPAA compliant data or just publicly available data that might be used for research, right? Um, Terry, did you want to add some points? I, I do, and, and part of it is, you know, during those years where things had stalled um, in, in terms of the landscape of, of bringing data together, the work in Kansas didn't stop. So building good data infrastructure um, in some of our early childhood programming, certainly with the cabinet and some of our other state agencies, that work continued. And that's the foundation, uh, uh, another piece of the foundation that we have to build in. To, to build upon because um, frankly, we are data rich in Kansas with early childhood data because we spent, we didn't you know, just say, oh, I guess we can't do this. We spent the time and the effort to make sure that we had good data quality and good data systems and um, working with our local providers so that when the time came and, and we're in the time, uh, we would be ready with good data infrastructure. So. Um, thinking about kind of parallel processes, depending on where folks are at in governance and in political will and championing, still building um, good data capacity uh, is, is key. Otherwise, um, you know, connecting data or looking at data is, is not going to be as successful. All right. So just as that brief recap, that's kind of those three different elements we were talking about, right? Having the political support around this having a champion or multiple champions to really help lead the charge and drive this work forward. And then kind of that data expertise that we were just talking about that CPPR really brings to the table of folks who have experience researching with and handling this type of data. One of the second major lessons that, that we've kind of learned from our conversations with Terry and Melissa together 
um, are about how you handle these different types of data and how you address some of these privacy concerns. So again, thinking back to that um, analogy I was drawing earlier, if we're thinking about different countries or different types of data, there are always going to be different norms, standards, and applicable laws. And one of the challenges is how do we ensure that we reflect these different norms, standards, and laws uh, when we bring all this data together in one space? How do we make sure that we're not kind of lowering privacy protections for a certain type of data when we bring it into a space where it's maybe interacting with you know, publicly available data or something like that? So what this looks like for Kansas, um, there are a variety of different applicable laws, right? There's FERPA, HIPAA, there's publicly available data, which really doesn't have sort of the same protections in place as other work. Um, there's also the Kansas Student Data Privacy Act, which overlaps heavily with FERPA, but also has some additional kind of periphery protections around there. Uh, and one of the challenges is trying to understand when you get data coming into a data trust, where does it lie in this diagram, right? Does it lie completely in HIPAA? Is there some overlap between HIPAA and FERPA? Is it dead center where it could technically be covered by any of these different regulatory regimes? And then for the data trust, how do we actually handle that data then? How do we implement privacy protections that we believe will be compliant with these different types of laws when we might not be 100% certain what laws are even applicable? And again, surrounding all of this too, there's broader laws that regulate everything, right? Um, there are data breach notification laws. I believe Kansas does have a data breach notification law. Um, there's a disposal of records law in Kansas as well that might come into play at different times, right? And so Brian, one of the things that with regard to this, as we're building out our data trust agreement and our data governance structure, we're looking at how do we classify the data um, in terms of levels um, and certainly around the, the particular uh, protections. But, um, you know, that's, that's key information when our data governance board receives requests for bringing data together. We need to classify it. You know, if this is public data, okay, you know, that's, that's something, um, you know, different. But if it's level three personal identifiable HIPAA um, data that's going to be matched with personally identifiable FERPA data, I mean, that's when you need, you, you've got to have um, your ship very tight uh, around um, how you handle it, how you match it, all of the uh, infrastructure on the back end, but also the legalese and, and the um, restrictions of usage in the agreement itself. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, Melissa, did you have anything else there? Well, I would just say that that, that in itself is why agencies have been somewhat reluctant, particularly since the addition of the Student Data Privacy Act. They just look for ways to avoid entering data sharing agreements. Um, you know, there's a, a predisposition to at, at the, call it the mid-management level where agency legal departments reside to avoid and look for ways not to share data. And I think that's the value of the work underway is um, we have an opportunity from the leadership level to support the movement and with the data trust agreement, I, I'm really excited about the, the feasibility of creating a framework that will facilitate the individual use case agreements that will need to be generated for each given project. So it'll give us the, the framework and the plan and, and resolve a lot of the concerns in the broad data trust so that we can focus on the nitty gritty details of, of the specific project and, and what needs to be shared and how that will happen. And I think both of your points really segue well into kind of this, this next slide about how do we resolve some of these privacy concerns. Um, one thing that you both mentioned early on is, is how do we frame this type of data, right? Uh, this isn't kind of a new data collection effort. This is connecting data um, that already exists, that is already collected by and used by these state agencies. We're just kind of facilitating collaboration here. And, and one of the things, Terry, that I think you've mentioned in conversations with me is that connecting this data doesn't mean we forget about privacy. It means that we're taking it into account in a new context, right? We're, we're keeping those privacy concerns at the top of mind as we start going about this collaborative work. Uh, and, and another thing that we've discussed is defaulting to the highest level of protection, right? So when we're trying to decide what level of data does that, that mean, whether that's kind of like level one, less sort of sensitive data that we, we don't need to take as much care of, 
or level three data where we really need to implement strict privacy controls, um, we need to kind of examine what the default option is, right? If we can't be certain what should be applied or if we can't be certain uh, whether something is maybe level two or level three or, or these cases on the margins, we default to these higher level of protections. And that gets into this wider idea of privacy by design, which I think both Terry, you and Melissa were hinting at in your earlier comments, that as we design this governance architecture, before we even get to the technical stage of how do we design what we need technically to actually implement this, when we're designing the governance framework, we really need to keep this idea of privacy at the forefront. And as we design all of these different sort of governance features, we think about, okay, what are the potential privacy issues and concerns that could arise? And how do we address them in a proactive way so that we're not caught on the back foot when we run into issues down the line, or if something comes up when we're just implementing the technical architecture that we haven't planned for how to address. And I think, you know, that comes in, uh, what also comes into play in, is some of the conversations around um, consent and individual privacy and the enactment of, of this kind of work in an environment where we know uh, um, of uh, the need to be mindful of how the data itself is collected from individuals who is missing from that data, who is represented, who is underrepresented, some of the equity issues um, that are driving a lot of our work in early childhood is around accessibility and availability of services and being able to understand um, the inequity gap um, also means being uh, mindful of, of sort of the privacy by design concept, which is um, whose voices are we missing at the table when we start talking about this uh, data um, and who consents to that process, who doesn't. Um, so thinking about how do we weave in ethical data use? How do we uh, weave in some of the algorithms that are inherent in uh, biases and in, in data itself? Who gets services, who doesn't? Um, those are all, all pieces of um, our data trust agreement that we feel is critical, uh, that we feel are critical and important to call out specifically because as we, as we move through this work, we don't wanna perpetuate um, biases in the data that, that might already exist. Melissa, did you have anything else there? We can move on. All right, but I think that point you highlighted, Terry, is, is really key around ethics. And, and I think that's one of the advantages of a data trust um, design as opposed to just a simple data sharing agreement, right? There's more to a data trust than just saying we agree to share data and these are the kind of legal agreements that we sign off on. There's an ethical component to it as well and really kind of ensuring that ethics are kept in mind as we use and start to uh, connect these different data pieces. And I would, I guess I would add to that, that that concept is one of the harder cells that we've encountered. I think we're over the, the the initial hump of, of getting people to understand the difference between the data trust and a data sharing agreement. I mean, it, it even took me a, a, a meeting or two to, to really wrap my head around it. But um, I, I, th I think now that people understand that, that, that these are two different things, there, there is a connection and an overlap, but I, I think people are starting to pick up um, the level of, of support for this idea as, as there's better understanding of what we mean by establishing a data trust agreement and why that matters so much. I think it'll facilitate the development of the individual data sharing agreements. If you know, and that's the design of it, right? Is, is that when you get to this common agreement, it's easier to outline the, the specific um, parameters for each case than, than when you're starting from essentially scratch every time two agencies want to come together and, and connect data for a project. And the ethical use piece is kind of the shared values that um, each of the agencies and, and the players in the enactment of this data trust are, are coming to the table with. Um, I mean, those should be four, first four uh, at the four of, of the work. And as, as we enact the data governance um, uh, board, those kinds of questions become part of the application to either to share data or to receive data or to use the data. This, these are our principles. This is how we're gonna use it. 
Um, and uh, that is kind of the foundation of, of the trust. I mean, that's what trust in, in another sense means, right? And I think in the specific context of privacy as well, ethics around data governance are ethics around data trust, right? There, there's so much overlap between what good data governance is and what good data privacy is. Um, and, and, you know, not to air dirty laundry, but data can be used for, um, for as, as many folks know, for ill. And, in, you know, we, there is some history in um, certainly probably every state around um, data being used in, in ways that are not um, beneficial for children and families. And so how can we come together around a shared value with that and a little bit of teeth around um, uh, that concept, uh, you know, uh, trust but verify um, is, is kind of the idea there. All right, so just as a brief summary of what we've talked about, um, there are kind of two lessons here with sort of three points under each. The first is what you need to put together if you're trying to build a state level data collaborative. Uh, you need kind of the political will to get behind it. You need a champion or multiple champions to help drive that work forward. And you need data expert expertise and really kind of engaging with people who have experience using this data to actually impact outcomes or measure impacts so that you can make sure that the data is actually being used. Uh, the other is how you address multifaceted privacy concerns. Uh, one is kind of this framing idea around explaining what the status quo is and how your case might differ from that, or in the case of Kansas, doesn't really differ from the status quo that dramatically. Um, talking about what the default protections are for data. Are we going to design this in such a way that the default protection is fairly high? Um, that's probably the best way to kind of enhance privacy as we do this. And it might actually not just be maintaining privacy, but enhancing privacy beyond what's already being done. And then privacy by design. So as we look at creating this data trust architecture, um, how are we making sure that privacy is incorporated from the very front to ensure that when issues do inevitably arise down the line, we are prepared to handle them, we know what we're going to do, and we know what the privacy practices are that we want to put in place. Uh, Terry and Melissa, before we move to Q&A, do you have any points you also want to drive home? All right. Well, now we have some time for questions with Melissa and Terry. Um, so I believe we have some things in chat. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Um, and then we can also just keep adding questions in chat, or we have a small enough group here. If folks just want to speak up, that's fine as well. So going off of the first question, uh, was the 2020 ACF grant the PDG? Yeah, it was. And actually, the collaboration between the four agencies began in 2018 with a, a, a Kansas was chosen by the National Governors Association to be part of a cross-sector collaboration mentoring project. So we were one of five states chosen to be mentored on how to better collaborate across state agencies. That mentoring project led to our application as a team effort. Um, the four agencies together applied for the PDG. We got the one-year planning grant and spent 2019 doing our needs assessment and strategic plan. And then um, we're, we were one of the three late uh, awards given for 2020 and to renew the grant for the next three years. So this is a key component of our, it, it was identified in the needs assessment as a need. It, it's a key component of our strategic plan and um, it will be at the forefront of our work moving forward over the next several years. So we, we have a really nice opportunity to leverage some funding to cover the cost of this with um, the, the ability to, to make the case as a team that this is a, a good and necessary project to, to get underway. And to add to that, I mean, this is the long game. I mean, the long game. And, um, you know, some of the states who, uh, and certainly in K through 12, the idea of linking it to preschool or to college and career, that's, that work has moved ahead um, kind of in sort of in, in the education sphere, um, data quality campaign and, and that work. And, um, you know, the patience with which we must uh, wait for opportunity uh, is, is um, maddening, uh, depending on uh, 
kind of just coupled with a seize the day moment um, yes. mindset to, to really harness the energy we have right now and get it done quickly. So right. it's a balancing act. <laughs> which is why, I mean, that, which is why we really wanted to invest in solid data governance. Um, so that could uh, sustain us for the long run so that we didn't uh, lose any of the progress um, that we've made. And so thinking about um, the data governance as the sustaining piece rather than kind of expensive infrastructure to connect all of these different systems Certainly, um, you know, that's maybe the longer game, but Kansas needs to focus on sustainability with low cost, just like every other, just about every other state at this point. So how can we be intentional about the technical side of things? And, um, you know, that comes back to interoperability versus integration from, from Nancy Smith earlier. And we're choosing the integration approach at the moment. So authorized projects kind of dictate what data comes together and how we're going to analyze it rather than sort of the APIs across all of these different agencies to enact some um, magical thing that may or may not ever happen. We've got to seize the day now, which means being nimble and, and um, able to kind of rapidly move this data to insight so that we get some wins around um, uh, some of the key questions that our policymakers are uh, asking, some of the key questions that our state agency partners are asking, we've got to get that now. We can't wait, you know, 10 years down the line. All right. And I think Jim, Daniel, you had some questions as well. Yeah. Um, so by way of background, Andrew Means connected me up to Bright Hive a while ago. So I met David Goodman. I was fascinated to find out about all the work. And I noticed it was a lot of state agencies. So it was Kansas, Colorado, some public private partnership stuff in Louisiana. But in each case, it was state work. My work after leaving tech 10 years ago for the last decade has been with international NGOs. And while, they're, um, while they collect vast oceans of information and data, they are really badly uh, positioned. They're very siloed and they're not very good. And the comment that was made, I think it was you, Melissa, was we put in place structures and expertise and so forth. And we, I'm, I'm very curious as to figure out how bad the gap is between what you guys thought was a minimum viable skill set in order to get going versus what I, where I think the uh, international NGOs are. Um, so what, what was, give me, if you were to just, just riff, like if you could wave a magic wand, you should have these types of human skills, these types of processes, and these types of, of technical capabilities in order to get, get the ball rolling. I, I'm, I will I want Terry to be prepared to back me up on this. I would say um, for, for us here in Kansas and our experience, the children's cabinet has been, um, we, we were um, put into statute in 1999 and in our statutory guidance from inception, using data to drive our decisions has been a mandate. So we have had to, to figure this out over time. And that's where KUCPPR comes in. They have provided that backbone support and research um, uh, capability to help guide all of the, the ways that, that we as a cabinet use our data. And I will tell you, it has stood us in good stead. We have twice in very big, very um, potentially damaging studies, we have been held up as the, the example of the right way to leverage data to drive decision making. So whether it was, um, we had in 2016 an outside audit team, Alvarez and Marsal was engaged by the state legislature um, under the previous um, governor's administration, a very um, conservative leaning mindset to, to put it very politely. Um, Alvarez and Marsal conducted a, 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 an overview, a, an analysis of state government and, and they were looking for waste, fraud and abuse and, and ways to cut spending. And we came out, the outcome of that was that the children's cabinet process and methods were held up as the gold standard that other agencies should um, implement in, a, in their decision-making models. 
Couple that with a, a legislative post audit, that's sort of our state level um, GAO, if you will. It's a neutral third party state agency that, that audits things that are directed to audit. Um, in 2019, they were directed to audit our Department of Commerce and all of the economic development programs they had to offer. And again, they, the cabinet was the entity. They, they described looking across the, the landscape of, of different agencies and entities operating in Kansas for a viable model for commerce to adopt. And it was our, our children's cabinet model. So I would throw it to Terry to describe the work that the, the researchers at KUCPPR do to help us present on the right. So if I can just sharpen my question then, if you look at the management team of a large, let's say a $1 billion international NGO, um, they are really a disparate collection of a lot of activities. The data is all siloed. By the time you get to the top, you don't have the equivalent of that statutory oversight that you would expect would be there. You don't have the audit, the same depth of audit. Um, and most importantly, and probably the thing you said is super important is in spite of all the lip service to using data to drive decision making, which is very true on on the ground programming, it's rarely true at executive decision making. I mean, something as simple as we have precious unrestricted funds to put towards whatever innovative, impactful program we want to invest in. They're not going to go gather the data about um, trade offs. It often becomes, you know, purely in internal politics, right? Or who has access to more restricted funds. So there's not good dashboarding, there's no predictive analytics, there's no, you know. So as you're talking, Terry, about the skill sets that the researchers have, what, what are they using or doing that makes you confident in the way you've been working? Well, um, that's a lot uh, of, of things to cover. Let me, let me say a couple of things. This, um, I'm gonna plug Gabby and Genevieve around their, uh, their model of, uh, um, uh, data-driven culture um, in organizations. So if, if the top is not listening to data, you know, that's, you're going to have a hard time. Um, our governor listens to data. Our executives listen to data. They value it. So if your organization isn't valuing data, you got a bigger, bigger problem to solve. Um, but when it comes to the skill sets that um, I think are critical, it's the, being able to translate the technical piece, yes. But you have to have that adaptive ability to understand the political nuances and the players and uh, what resonates with each, each person. Um, you know, we have been involved with our state agencies, you know, for a while here. We saw an opportunity intuitively around the willingness and, and uh, you know, the political will and the champion to make this happen. We stepped through that real hard and real fast because those windows of opportunity don't come around quickly. So if you don't have folks who can recognize that nuance. Um, we, you know. We've done battle. We, we resolved a, a, a 10 year long school finance legal case. And the legislature, as I was part of it, was, was very combative about investing in our schools. We had a leadership change at the Department of Education. A new commissioner came in about five years ago, and he brought a really nice calming mindset uh, and, and in, instituted a process that, that gained the confidence of the business community and some of the more conservative leaders in Kansas and, and brought the state board along um, State Board of Education adopted a program called Kansans Can, which is the vision for public education in Kansas. It has five key components. So kindergarten readiness is everything prior to kindergarten entry. That, that covers our world of early childhood. Um, on the other end, um, point number five that they focus on is post-secondary success. So we actually have this opportunity because of the groundwork laid, developing Kansans Can, speaking to lawmakers for several sessions running to convince them of the, 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 the need to, to open up their thinking beyond this one time 
you know, summative assessment, the state assessment test, but, but he has really done a lot of adaptive work with, with lawmakers that is paying dividends because we have a, a Governor's Council on Education is a place that a year ago under, or actually two years ago now under, um, we had a, a governor in between, Governor Kelly, who is our current governor and Governor Brownback. There was Governor Collier for about eight months and he, he started this Governor's Education Council and Governor Kelly reorganized it, but continued the same. So it's like a blue ribbon task force. And so under Governor Collier, so you, you suddenly, you know, you have a political party leader who brings along legislative leaders um, who align with his thinking. There was a data sharing agreement put in place between our K through 12 system and not just higher education, but also our Department of Reve Revenue and Commerce so that we could track the post-secondary success side of this continuum. So now we're using the Governor's Education Council as a venue to, to move a recommendation that will help us build this data trust agreement to get the early childhood years connected. So then we actually will have completed the arc of, of the full continuum of prenatal to, to adulthood and, and post-secondary um, success. What careers are, are people, it, it, it really will model the high school Perry type of study where we can really tell well into adulthood what health outcomes and job, job uh, yeah, prospects and, and all of those things. That is the big picture goal that we have in mind is, is to really be able to draw on the story that we can tell simply by getting the arrangement for data to be shared and, and, and get agencies talking to each other that way. And we've got about 13 more minutes left and around maybe four more questions. So we'll try and move through these um, relatively quickly to make sure we can try and get to everything. Um, Mike Smiles had a question. Were organizational grants or cooperative funding aspects important to get started? Or was it because of the need for better outcomes based on leading slash founding entities? Mike, was there anything else you wanted to add there? It was just really that we're establishing a coalition for volunteer impact. I'm with volunteermatch.org and looking at sort of an international exchange hosted by Giving Tuesday. And we're just trying to get that formulation going, whether it will be an impetus grant. We had gone for a, a Rockefeller data challenge grant, didn't get it for a million dollars. It's more of just, we're thinking that, you know, we have a relationship with, with Stanford Civil Society Lab and just curious if that university relationship might be one of the more important aspects of how everything got founded for you. Thank you. I, I would say so. I, 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 my cabinet could not be doing what we're doing without our relationship to KU. And actually, we, we also um, work with Wichita State University. They have the um, Community Engagement Institute, which also provides some um, research support and, and helps us with... Um, the, the qualitative analysis we do of our programs. So it, it's been key. I would say the, the, the shot of federal funding has been the, the, the kicker that, that really got us going because without that funding source, you know, there, there are costs involved, costs to engage Bright Hive to consult and, and help us shape the, the legal agreements. And, that's been worth it because of the speed at which we've been able to get moving through the cycle of a project that has been talked about for a, a decade. I'll certainly, Thank you. Plug a, I'll certainly plug a university partnership um, all, day, all day. Um, I think it's it, finding the right partnership though. Um, you know, faculty departments have their research agendas, but finding more of a public uh, engagement or um, community engaged uh, group at a university is, is uh, your better option. So that the agenda is a shared agenda versus a, um, uh, a research agenda. All right, and Claire, you had a point around discussing potential collaborations on projects using synthetic data. Was there a question that you wanted to, to add to there? Oh, not really. I was attending this uh, 
half day governance uh, event because I'm trying to gauge what are the interests on all sides. So I, I should clarify, my name is Claire Bowen. I'm from the Urban Institute and I'm the lead data scientist for privacy and data security. And my specialty is in using synthetic data generation to publicly release data for use. And also I'm trying to build up more trust with participants. And so just hearing everybody's concerns and, and some of the points and their needs, it's, this has been very great and enlightening and, and like I said, I'm trying to learn more. And I shot out for a potential collaboration is because there's some talks with my uh, some of my colleagues at the Urban Institute about how are there ways that we can help cities across the country on being getting better access to data and wondering if there are like tools we can develop because these data privacy techniques, uh, although they seem to work, sometimes don't work very well. And you still need to have that expert to, to massage it, but there's not enough experts. So wondering if there's like, dissemination materials we should develop, or like I said, a toolkit, which is what we're trying to think of, but still meeting the needs and hearing feedback from others, because we don't want to end up like some agencies that they just kind of go blindly into a project thinking what they think what they people want, and then creating something that is very useless. So that was a very fast spiel because I'm trying to respect people's time. So Shout out to the Urban Institute and um, certainly follow um, your work there. Um, you know, there's no substitute for relationship based um, conversations. Um, so any tool or resource developed without um, kind of the people behind it and the conversations behind it is um, uh, is a, a, a Success is around building p partnerships with people and relationships. Um, I mean, we can have all the tech in the world and all of the tools in the world. world. If we don't have the conversations about what's going to change in order to make something happen, um, it's not, it's not going to work um, well. All right. Um, before we grab the next question, Melissa and Terry, just in case we don't get to all of the questions. Do you all mind if I drop your emails in the chat um, just for some potential follow up? Sure, not at all. I, that's the right answer. No, I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, Steve Francis, you had a question about application to community commercial context. Yeah, I, and my question is for really anybody on on the call because I, as far as I can tell, everybody's kind of interested in these these topics. Um, I'm with an organization called Tech Matters, a nonprofit based in California. Our focus at a high level is on changing the funders and the NGO environments, back to, to Jim's question, to be more appreciative of the value of technology and aiding their mission. Um, I personally am working on a project where I've spent the last nine months uh, interviewing local landscape leaders, so community leaders focused on sustainable development and sustainable change around the world. And, and what's emerged from those conversations is a need for, for a common data infrastructure, model agreements, and, and other things that will help them share data. Well, first of all, retain sort of control of their data, and then with control, share it appropriately, and also have sample agreements, model agreements that would encourage commercial entities to share data, which they might see otherwise as being um, competitively sensitive with these communities. And, and so ultimately my primary question is about standard model agreements for data sharing and data governments that might be applicable to these situations. And secondly, this concept of a trusted intermediary, somebody who all parties could trust to pull the data together and aggregate it, which would make it less sensitive after aggregation. I have um, something I could add real quick. It, this is playing out in, um, some of the work that we're doing in resource and, resource and referral networks in communities, um, particularly as we as the healthcare systems bring in um, vendors to provide technology uh, for physicians to refer to community-based organizations. So social determinants of health in that sphere, local communities and payers, insurers are starting to come in. So vendors and um, other systems are starting to come in and figure out how do we share data? Because that's the value for them is data received from these community organizations about a referral that got made and did that person engage in you know, diabetes prevention or whatever it might be. That's the value transaction. And right now it's really imbalanced um, for sort of the tech and the vendor and the payer system and healthcare system. Um, and there's no sort of reciprocity with, with community-based organizations. So 
how do you balance that? Um, that is one thing um, in order to have a truly collaborative relationship because you can have all the MOUs in the world between these organizations, but um, if there's not a shared value around why we're doing the work, why we're sharing the data, who, why it's valuable, um, you hit a lot of, of um, barriers. So that's, that's the one context I'm thinking about. Well, and from the, the Kansas perspective, the battle over data really revolved around commercial use. So I would say there's, I, I would be willing to bet that if what we were bringing forward already, you know, started with that broader context of um, bringing in the commercial side, we probably would, would hit a roadblock. So we are focused on the state agencies as our starting point, getting this data trust so that we can normalize the sharing of data between the agencies and, and take it, I think, in steps so that if a project presents itself and we have, I mean, we've privatized a lot of parts of the child welfare system and, and other aspects of, of the system we're, we're contemplating connecting. As we work to integrate all of those community level and commercial type of vendors and, and partners I, I would consider that that next level challenge. Let's get this data trust in place and working first. And Steve, to your to your point about um, standard agreement language or things like that, Bright Eye has put together some resources that I'll drop into the chat as well about just data governance more broadly that might be helpful there. Great. All right, it looks like we have one more question and we've got about three minutes left. So hopefully that'll be more than enough time. Um, Winnie Lee had two questions regarding one, data owned by local agencies, and two, how to build an elastic system. Winnie, do you want to elaborate there? Yeah, sure. I guess we only have time for the first question, which is more immediate need. Is when we work with other states, we notice that for some data, although the funding may come from federal or state governments, but the data are owned at local level. So when we ask local agencies to share data, we establish data sharing agreement. MOUs, but again and again, we encounter data privacy issues. An example is people would just share sensitive data by email, not using our secure server. So I'm curious whether Kansas has a systematic solution rather than our current band-aid solution, like the data has been removed from our email server. Um, it's nice to see um, Child Trends uh, joining us. Um, we certainly follow your work as well. Um, you know, that federal to local um, and sort of the local capacity to secure their own data, you know, oftentimes it's on a piece of paper or on an Excel sheet. A lot of that is education. And, you know, it's something that we're going to have to confront when we think about early Head Start and Head Start data because that's federal to local. When it, when it comes to um, some of the federal dollars to the state agencies that gets granted down to the local providers, that is the chain of trust and the chain of um, the ability of the children's cabinet and our, our, and our state agencies to govern the data jointly. They sort of own it um, as funders, if you will. Um, and so we haven't cracked the nut about uh, sort of the local federal to local and how to um, lift all boats um, in a systematic way of, um, other than continuing to, you know, uh, emphasize privacy and certainly, I mean, folks are still emailing stuff. Um, I don't, I, I don't have a solution to a, a person problem, you know, sort of a, a, a people problem. Um, it'd be nice to have, uh, have a solution. So I assume you're going to get right on that for us. Okay. Thank you. 